the, the idea is how you can find hidden gold in your company. Okay. So it's not just about the wizard coming around, about how I've worked with clients and helped them find untapped assets. And it turned into a lot of money over the years, millions and millions and millions of dollars that just were unseen, unthought of. And so here we go. Most of the time when I got hired, uh, it was because there was stagnant growth or profit erosion, competitive uh, pressure. And a lot of times my business was better in recessions and in, in troubled seas ahead um, because then people started to think, well, you know, it was, it's been good for a couple of years, but now what? And, and so that may be highly applicable to right now. I think I've gone through th four major recessions in my career. We've always helped people in spite of the economic climate. So I'm pretty proud of that. The idea is if you can harness the wizard's magic, you can succeed beyond the dreams of avarice in almost any economic climate. I worked with, I had a, I had a home builder, a home inspector rather, come to me and uh, he had some things he wanted to do, but he asked me if, if he should shut down his business. And it was December. And, um, and I said, well, how much does the home inspection business contract in, in the, the winter in Milwaukee? And he said, oh, I would say about 30%. And so I drew, drew a circle on my whiteboard and I said, okay, we'll chop off 30% of it. Okay, and how much of that, of that marketplace does your company represent? <laughs> and I drew a little dot in the middle. And I said, okay, so I'm not going to tell you what to do. You could close down your business like all your competitors, but what if, and I drew some arrows outside of his dot, what if you worked a little bit and what if you tried to get some of that other 30% that you, or other 70% that's still around that everybody's ignoring? And so he decided that he would try it. And so I called him up about six weeks later and I said, well, how did it go? And he said, well, I decided to just buy donuts and go visit my old clients. Uh, you know, and mostly it was banks and attorneys and stuff that would do closings. And he said, I just walked in and said, I'm still in business. And, you know, if you have any home inspections you need done, I'm available. He, I said, well, how did it work out? He said, not only was it my best January, it was my best month ever. Okay, now I don't expect, I don't expect the economy to contract 30%, right? But it just shows you that, you know, we get our minds focused on the waves and the storm, and we forget about all the business that is still on, out there on the table. So spinning straw into gold takes magic. My book is based on the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, how is that? How is that like the marketing industry? Well, the, mill, the miller lies about the money-making capabilities of his daughter. The miller tells the king, my daughter can spin straw into gold. And then the queen cheats Rumpelstiltskin out of his consulting fee. He agrees to spin the straw into gold for her firstborn child, and then she figures out a way to cheat him. What? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's okay. So, what are the big marketing lies? Well, I got started in the marketing world in printing and, and advertising in the 70s, but 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 in the 80s, we started to be collecting data. And so the two big lies that have perpetuated until this day are we know who you are and what you'll buy. And you can't grow both your growth, your profit of gold and your customer uh, circulation and all that. You gotta, you gotta go, it's expensive to grow. So you gotta choose. And I had a, com a company I was talking to was almost completely ruined by that thinking. A couple, just a couple of years ago, Mike actually knows, knows them. 
<laughs> we think they're still around. They're still working with Mike. Okay, so what about- Yes, we yes they are. <laughs> yes, they are. Good for you. I'm, I'm proud of you anyway. Okay, we know who you are. Okay, so supposedly there's a huge mega database, you know, the big data of the world. And uh, we're going to do predictive modeling in AI. We're going to and we're going to predict what you're going to buy. OK, so think just think of the last time you went to a big box store like a Walmart and or a Costco and you had some things you were interested in buying. And the question is, how how many times do you go in there and buy exactly what you intended, neither more nor less? For me, it's like one in a hundred because, you know, they might be out of stuff I want. They might have changed brands or uh, or I find more likely I find something I can't resist because, uh, you know, they say 80 percent of retail is is impulse buys. And so one way or the other, I, I, I can't predict me at all. <laughs> walking into a, a big store. That's why my wife doesn't let me go. But uh, the, the bottom line is, if I can't predict me knowing all I know about me, how much data do you have on me? And what are your chances of predicting what I'll buy next? I mean, I ask people, do you know what you're going to buy next in the next three days? <laughs> and you probably don't, right? You know, I mean, I'm buying an alternator today because my wife got stranded up in the middle of Wisconsin. Uh, and she kind of contributed to that situation. But I didn't know yesterday I was going to buy an alternator. <laughs> and today, that's what their main budget item is. So technology is important. But, you know, when I started, the big news in the industry was Selectronic Bindery. Farm Journal and R.R. R. Donnelly got together and they... They figured out that that hog farmers and wheat farmers were different kinds of farmers and that they could do different versions of the farm journal and get more advertising dollars and 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 segment the content a little bit toward the kind of farmer that you were. And so in the in the late 70s and early 80s, the big news was someday all the content would be would be customized you know and i i go on to espn almost every day i do it with my phone so they know who i am they know who my favorite teams are and and all the time they're shoving sports at me that i don't even want after decades of it will be customized to your needs and you i told them what i wanted they don't even have a way for me to tell them what i don't want and it's sad. And what's even funnier to me, the bottom line there down here, it says RFM is still considered high tech. And I, I, I searched on recency frequency monetary. That's what RFM means. And we were doing it back in the 80s. And uh, once we got the orders into a computer and we could keep track, I did work for Gurney Seed and Nursery out in Yankton, North Dakota, South Dakota. And I told him that, you know, it might be handy to know who'd bought more than once. You know, it was like, you think so, John? I said, I think so. I said, do you have, you know, records on your computer? Well, no, but we got boxes. <laughs> and they literally had all the shipping papers from years and years and years. And I said, well, you know, you can send those down to Jamaica. Remember that data center, Mike, that was in Jamaica yeah. that would, I remember. you know, yeah, yeah, man. yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> they were a good deal. And, you know, until we got to that point, you couldn't really know who bought multiple frequency times. They would just, they would build their mailing list off, uh, you know, their whole address file. And it does work, but I think we could go a little beyond that, right? So I started thinking about, well, what kinds of discoveries have I made over the years? And they kind of boiled down into, into these categories. There were customer and prospect market discoveries where we found, we found something, and oftentimes it was kind of a stumble over. We found entirely new markets that they had not even thought about, and it generated millions of dollars in growth almost immediately. 
we'd also sometimes come up with new offers or new ways of phrasing the offers they were using. Uh, sometimes the machine learning and the scientific experimentation uh, contributed to these, to these two. We could at least verify it with the direct marketing principles. And sometimes it was kind of just walking around and spotting things because you can do that. So if we were thinking about just the basic basics, like I was talking with Gurney Seed and Nursery, we might say, okay, let's think about, we, we don't wanna mail all of our customers. Let's think about who we might not wanna mail. And oftentimes the answer is, well, let's not mail the one-time buyers. Let's mail the multi-buyers. You know, maybe you mailed the one-time buyers six weeks ago. So, and maybe you've been mailing them for years, so you say, well, I just don't need to mail everybody. So I'm gonna just mail this. Now, you notice that the one-time buyers are oftentimes more than half your file. So it, it's a big reduction. And then you wake up in the middle of the night and you think to yourself, well, wait a minute. What about the one-time buyers that also have big, big orders? <laughs> you know, that's kind of how our RFM starts to work. And you start thinking, well, these are one-time buyers, but they're up in the, fours and fives of lifetime monetary value. So we better mail some of these and we can mail a little deeper into the uh, into the, the three score buyers that maybe not worth as much, but you know, and that's kind of how it works. So basically we're cutting out the, we're mailing the really valuable uh, high frequency buyers and we're mailing the high monetary low frequency buyers. Does that make sense? It's real simple, um, and there's all kinds of there's all kinds of formulas for that, but that's basically the idea of RFM. And if you put the most recent buyers, you should probably mail the recent one-time buyers. Although one of my big discoveries in the last couple of years uh, with the oldest catalog in America was that their their um, digital acquired buyers were worse than almost any other segment that they mailed that they were the worst, doesn't matter much how much they spent or what they bought. Uh, you didn't want to mail them for a while because there was a seasonal pattern in there. So one, one thing that's wrong with it is cutting circulation kills growth. So I said to Dick Cabela, why, you know, you could cut 20% of your circ and only cut 5% of your sales. And he said, I don't want to cut 5% of my sales. <laughs> I'd have to lay people off. <laughs> show me how to grow, don't show me how to cut. That was one of the smartest things anyone ever said to me. And uh, Dick, bless his heart, was not, you know, very statistically oriented. And I'm not sure he got very far beyond, beyond high school, but he really had a lot of wisdom. He, I learned a lot from Dick, okay? But what happens with RFM is it masks the best and it masks the worst. So it combines uh, a lot of like the, that one-time buyer thing if you use Arthur Hughes's formulas, you'd split that into a couple of segments, even though they all bought once. Um, but more than that, it hides some of the, of the anomalies and the hidden magic. Plus, on those one-time buyers who haven't bought lately and haven't bought much, <laughs> those guys, you need a little more data. RFM just doesn't give you an idea of how to split up the buyers. Because if you take an average, this, you know, this is just a typical customer file. The one one ones are at the are this big, huge piece. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Can you see me move around? Okay, good. Okay, this this is the one one ones. It's not even. It's just one ones. Uh, this is the low frequency one time buyers and the low monetary. And it's like I said, it's about sixty percent of the file. And you can put recency in there, but if your business has been in business for a while, it's it's probably even worse. Okay. So RFM is really good at cutting circ because you just blast these guys. But but you know that if you mailed all of these or contacted them with email or you know however you however you contact customers you know that if you if you contacted these you'd get some orders because these are people that have ordered from me in the past they know you to some extent right okay so when we talk about straw what what do we mean you know because i'm going to help you spin straw into gold well the first thing is that straw is not hay 
I called my feed mill and, and, I, and that's what, the, what they told me. I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, hey, that's what they, you know, you see the bales. Well, if you're out, if you're <laughs> in my yard, you'd see, or the neighbors got a, got a farm. Uh, you see big bales or rolls of hay and they feed that to the animals through the winter. It's a, it's, it's, it's very valuable. It's full of nutrients. And um, that's not what straw is. Straw is the leftover stock after you've chopped the top of the wheat off. So it's, it's a sanitary product. It's what you put under the animals to catch the caca that comes out of the animals. And that's mostly what we start with in first party data. Is that fair, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> a lot of stuff that just gets thrown into a pile. And so I always laugh when people ask about our security measures and stuff. And it's like, well, you know, we have really good security, but what if somebody stole your mailing list? What if they stole your customer list? What if they, you know, in the, in the nonprofit world, we exchange those all the time, you know, take, okay, we'll give you, the, we'll give you our two-year-old donors that haven't re-upped and you, and you give us your two-year-old donors and they don't do very well. They might do a little better than a rented list, but not, not really. And so it's like, hmm. Even if somebody stole and, and and then you say, well, yeah, but what if they got the transaction data? And most of the time, that's that's a company that hasn't done anything with their transaction data, doesn't even have it on file anywhere, you know, has no way to, to access it, has no summarization, has no variables. So the key is the data has to be turned into variables because your marketing or your your ERP or your order processing data, your first party data was not created by marketing. It was created by the process of taking orders. And so it's a byproduct, just like straw. Now there's, you know, we're gonna get, there's gold in segmentation because you can bear, vary the spend by the worth of the customer. And somebody asked me just the other day, what, you know, if we didn't do all the fancy modeling, what do you think the, uh, what do you think the, if, if you just did RFM, you know, what's the incremental value of the, of the modeling? And I said, well, for most clients, for small mailers, you know, you probably get at least 80% of the value out of it, just paying attention with RFM. But as we said, you lose out on knowledge of the targets and you lose out on what to do with the 111s. Okay. So, and what you're really trying to do beyond RFM is understand product extensions and behavior dimensions. So, Cabela's had an RFM system. They had transactions and they even had check boxes. So if you bought a fishing item, if you bought one $5 lure, you got a fishing check, but you might have bought $5,000 of hunting stuff. And so, and they were, they were slavishly connected to recency. They, they, after 12 months, they wouldn't mail you a catalog anymore. They would just send you a postcard. In fact, I went around to sporting goods stores asking people if they'd ever heard of Cabela's. This is before they had all their big stores. And, and everybody, everybody, about 40 people said to me, I used to get their catalog. <laughs> and I thought, huh, that's interesting. So anyway, when I, you know, when they sent us their data and I got to know them a little bit, well, the first time we modeled it, it was just scary. We were modeling the fishing, the fishing mailing and we were modeling it in November because their their cutoff for I think they were they were printing with with uh, Meredith I think um, but their cutoff was was like December first that they had to have everybody pulled for the fishing and you know and we were just getting started with modeling we didn't we really didn't know what we were doing but you know I thought oh well we'll figure it out as we go. And RFM, the recency, didn't come up at all. I called Tim Maybe, who was uh, the statistician at Neiman Marcus. And I said, Tim, if recency isn't in a model, what does that tell you? And he <laughs> said, your model's wrong. That's what it tells you. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. But we were modeling the specific, mail, the specific fishing mailers and buyers from the previous year. Well, it turns out that if your company sells hunting and fishing gear and you're, you're, you're pulling the data in November, guess 
who you've got mostly for the most recent buyers, hunters. And in fact, Dick Cabela said, our number one customer complaint is, why do you send me all these hunting catalogs? Or why do you send me all these fishing catalogs? Because you might have bought $5,000 worth of hunting, but you bought one fishing lure or a life jacket or who knows what, and you'd get all the fishing catalogs. And in fact, it was worse than that. Because if you bought, if you bought right at the, at the beginning of January for the fishing catalog and they would, they would start mailing you through the year and you'd get camping and you get footwear and archery and hunting, 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 hunting. If you didn't place another order right away, you wouldn't get another fishing catalog ever. <laughs> and so Cabela's told me when we got going that, oh, I'll have the graph. We're gonna do the whole little bit of a case study on Cabela's. I'll show you the graph when it comes up. So the idea is that you have to create variables that make some sense. Little rows of numbers and letters, the first party data, the big data, the, the browser data, even the mailing data, you got to pile that into, into reasonable piles because variables are lenses with which you see things, okay? And you can do a lot of stuff. You can create variables with a, lot, a wide variety of data sources. Now we're actually getting the, uh, the abacus propensity to buy remote, I guess I'd call it. And, um, you know, like whether you're still alive and stuff like that, <laughs> you can integrate all that. Um, but you can also create behavior categories dynamically, and then you can append the data like the propensity to buy. So you might be looking at five or six year old data at five or six year old customers. You don't necessarily, you know, the, the whole I had one client who didn't use Abacus and I asked him why. And they said, well, I'm trading my hotline for, for reviving my dead buyers. <laughs> and there's, that was some wisdom in that. I don't know if you know, if everybody knows, but Abacus was created by a whole bunch, dozens and dozens and dozens of catalog companies sharing their recent buyer history and accumulating that data. So I might not be buying from Land's End anymore, but I might be buying from LLB. So if you're Land's End, you say to yourself, well, we'd like to mail deeper. We'd like to mail the four or five-year-old buyers, but we don't want to mail them all. So that little bit of information can tell you that, well, I'm not buying from Land's End anymore, but they did buy from LL Bean and they're on our file, so we could mail them. That's kind of the idea. It was a co-op setup, okay? So we also add can add geodemographics. And so you get things like income, home value, education, population, density, et cetera. And those things don't work very well, I admit. But when you're trying to break up that one, one, one column at the back, they can work, especially if you have some decent circulation. And especially if you don't try to get too fine about it. We actually get more predictive value out of the three digit zip code census data than we do out of five digit. And you know, everybody wants to do it at the household level. Boy, it just doesn't. It's hard to make it work. Here's a variable that I, I invented in my mind <laughs> when I was talking about modeling one time at a DMA show, and I was trying to think of a variable that I could, I could tell everybody about, but nobody had ever built. And so the werewolf variable is that was hypothetically the distance from the full moon that a customer tends to buy. And so we took a 48 hour window, the full moon moves all over the place. This was really hard to build this because Travis Seaton finally teased me into building it uh, <laughs> a few years ago. And so, you know, we got that window going and, and we did it for musician's friend because we thought, well, musicians are kind of crazy. Let's see if this matters. And so, you know, if, 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 it, if it doesn't really work, you would expect about a 15th of the sales to be coming in during that 15th of the month. Two days of the month, it's about a 15th. If a 15th of the sales are in there, then it's no big deal. And that's what we saw. So we thought, oh, nuts, it doesn't work. But then we looked at the number of customers that, were, that had a tendency to buy mostly on a full moon. And it turned out there were half as many customers as we expected. 
there were a 30th of the customers doing a 15th of the sales. So the, 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 the customers that bought during the full moon were twice as valuable as the rest of the customer file. How's that for a variable? But do you see how having a variable, if you don't have it, you don't know, right? And I don't know anyone else who's ever built it. But if you have, Mike, have you ever built it? No, 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 that's, but it's entertaining. I yes. like it. Well, not only is it entertaining, <laughs> but they're not the only one it worked for, I have to say. But uh, it's, yeah, we thought, well, those are nutty people. They might just be up in the middle of the night. Now, we told them that it worked, but, and we said, you know, you ought to use that with your, with your email blast. We can tell you who likes the full moon, you know, email them on the full moon. And they never did because it was totally separate. They said, no, you're the catalog guy. We're not talking to the email people. Okay. Yeah, you're but, taking away sales from me. Yeah, exactly. Is what they thought. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> but the point isn't whether it worked or not worked, but without making it, we couldn't know if it would ever work. And then we found out that it did that it did differentiate customer groups. Now, in addition, you can actually think dimensionally. So we worked with Musicians, no, we worked with Baseball Express for 10 years. We went through five different ownerships um, because they kept telling them that we, we really knew what we were doing when we tur turned out when customer seg uh, segmentation and selection was involved. And so after, uh, you know, we got, I mean, we got double the, the response rates that they'd ever seen from the best segments. Of course, with Cabela's, the top segment, customer segment pulled over 100% response rate which I had said publicly, I didn't think was even possible. It's possible. Anyway, so, so I called up the president of Baseball Express one day and I said, hey, do you, did you ever think about selling business to business? And he said, no, we're strictly consumer. We only sell to consumers. And I said, hmm, who buys these $4,000 pitching machines? Most kids don't have those in their backyard, right? I mean, Richie Rich did, but other than that. And he said, oh, well, leagues and colleges and even major league teams buy from us. I said, well, did you ever consider that's, that you could be selling at, you know, business to business? He said, no, we're strictly consumer. <laughs> he honestly did. So anyway, we started looking through the through the data and said, well, who buys these pitching machines and what else do they buy? And it turned out that if somebody bought line chalk, that they had a serious diamond, baseball diamond. I mean, we played in the backyard all the time, but we never put line chalk down, right? And so just by knowing that one little piece of information, we could create, just like we did hunting and fishing for Cabela's, independent of their little check marks, which didn't make any sense. We could tell who bought a lot of business to business products and who bought a few. So I went back to him and I said, you know, there's this, there's these thousands and thousands of people that are, that are business to business. You got to start calling them. And so we started an outbound telecenter for business to business, asking them what else they might buy. Then we actually hired some salespeople and we grew a $5 million division in about two years. And when we started with, with Baseball Express, they were only 5 million in sales. And when we finished, they were about 50 million. But one of the big factors was that this instantly doubled the size of the company. And that comes from data insight, right? But it was really not, it wasn't the database that revealed it. It was looking through the catalog and saying, huh, this is, this is a weird product, right? And we were able to do that for Cabela's. We helped them start a business to business division. We were able to do it with musicians friends started a business to business division and uh, a few others. So, you know, it helps to know what you're looking for. One, one other thing that variables can help with is spurious correlations. <laughs> Most people don't know what spurious correlations are, but I was talking, I interviewed a, a, a stats professor. Oops, I don't even know how to go backwards. Let's see if that, nope, I guess I went backwards. 
I interviewed a stats professor at University of California, and I said, what does big data get you? And he said, more spurious correlations. People don't realize the more data you have, the more likely you ha are to have nonsense connected. And there's this great website called spuriouscorrelations.com. This is actually the correlation over multiple years of the death caused by X-ray contrast media and bicyclists killed in collisions with two or three wheeled motor vehicles. <laughs> and, you know, you can pick anything. You could pick the, the amount of the barrels of oil exported by Norway per year, and it'll correlate with the swimming pool deaths or something. The more data you have, the more nonsense you have. And that's why it's important to create variables that make some sense. Okay, and there's, I mean, the 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 modeling world. Let's just we're going to get past the modeling to the case studies just in a second. But the modeling world basically has two main methods. One is regression, which is manual and easy to understand, but usually only has about six or seven variables that really make sense. Or neural net, which could be thousands of variables, but they really can't tell you what's doing what, which is dangerous. And they'll get really great gains on the model compared to me, but it won't do that in the, in the real world. So our modeling has a capability to show you what it's doing. So when we did our first Cabela's model, I said, Dick, I wanna show you this. And the staff all said, don't show Dick, he hates computers. And I said, well, he's paying a couple of hundred grand for this. I think he should know. So I said, Dick, pretend you just had one catalog left. Would you send it to a guy in Manhattan with a lot of money? Or would you send it to somebody in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, which is kind of blue collar, um, but in a lake area? And he said, well, I think I'd send it to the blue collar guy because he might not have much money, but he probably spends a lot on fishing. And hunting, actually, the Manhattan guy was the best, but fishing, absolutely right. And I said, yep. And this is how you see that, Dick. And he said, yep, that's what fishermen are like. And we went through the whole tree. And he, he just kept saying, yep, that's what fishermen are like. And because we had that middle of the road technology kind of between the two, we could spot a lot of stuff. These are subliminal messages for you. Okay. You know, so I started, I gave a couple of keynotes for the USPS, United States Postal Service. And I started wondering, you know, this is just, this is from 2019, I think. Um, but, and there's, they, uh, I think it's Gartner Group uh, comes out with this and they said, most, most of machine learning projects don't work at all. And I started thinking, well, I've made millions of dollars with, you know, doing this stuff. Why did it work? And one of the reasons is mail. And one of the reasons is mail has built in a built-in labeled data set. It has the built-in capability of self-learning direct marketing. So what we do is we take customers and we make the variables and then we, you know, we do a mailing and then we see on the back end, we do match back, right, Mike? Yeah, and we exactly. see who, yeah, we see who responded. And then we also know who didn't respond. And this seems evident, self-evidently important to modelers and to mailers but not to marketers mostly. You need a labeled data set. So when Jeopardy tried to teach Watson how to play Jeopardy, they had 127,000 historical Jeopardy questions. And they would write an algorithm, write a model, if you will, and let Watson test it on that historical set of right and wrong answers. They knew the right and wrong answers, okay? And if you've ever done a CAPTCHA, you've seen select all the squares of traffic lights. And you think, well, I'm human. Why do I have to do that? Well, it's not because you're human. What they want to know is they want to tell the computer, well, here are the traffic lights. And here are the traffic lights. And here are not traffic lights. OK, because if you're building a self-driving car and the car pulls up behind this little panel truck, you won't be able to see these traffic lights. And they and these don't look like traffic lights, really. But a human knows they are. And so these will still be visible and you get ready and hit the brakes. 
with a self-driving car. That's called a label data set. We know where the traffic lights are and where they aren't. And mail gives us that. It's baked right in. So mail has high engagement. You got to deal with it. It piles up. <laughs> it's also delivered and it's read by the decision maker. I, I, I go get the mail, but my wife reads the mail. <laughs> she says that to me. Well, didn't you read the mail? No, I don't read the mail. I just deliver the mail to you and you read the mail and you decide. So that's that gives mail an advantage that we know it gets delivered. Unlike, you know, if you do a Facebook ad, you don't know who Facebook tries to show it to, right? Right? They don't tell you who they try to show it to. You pick the geodemographics and stuff and they tell you, oh, we showed it to 20,000 people or whatever. So you don't know who they show it to. And you don't know if, if they pay any attention. But see, mail has engagement. You have to pay some level of attention. And so what mail gives us is it gives us the engaged viewers who didn't buy. And no other media gives you that. Right? And I've never heard anyone else say that. But that makes machine learning work for mail. The other reason I think that we did better than most is because, you know, everybody knows who their buyers are. And if you do RFM or better, you know who your best buyers are. Any system can identify that. But we focused on who might not buy, who's the least likely to buy. And that lets you re recreate your offer to, to target them. You can, when you find out who isn't buying, especially if you thought they were, and, and we've all mailed lists that we thought should work and don't work, <laughs> that gets your brain engaged. It's the, it's the scientific tests that fail that make you smarter. And then you can take the model and apply it to your prospect universe, especially those geodemographics that we, that we discounted a little bit. But assuming your offers are similar, it lets you extend and predict. It's really not predicted. It's really careful historical analysis. And you can also identify, for example, for Cabela's, we found out that they could mail five-year-old muzzleloader buyers and make a lot of money. The modeling where we can select subsections of all of these actually let us grow circulation, unlike RFM. It's kind of a breakthrough idea. I'm going to get to the case studies because we want you to have some fun, okay? But the ability to spot things and the ability to match back and analyze history plus a good wizard is very, very helpful, okay? And it allows you to increase circulation, product lines, and profits. Wow, this is animated. And so it goes around and around and around. So here's some of the clients that let us select their customers to be contacted, which I never quite got over the honor that that was, you know, that they would trust us to select who got a catalog and who didn't. You know, that's a real privilege. Here's the catalog clients that we worked with that weren't that you know didn't give us all our their data but did use us for stuff so we're going to talk about some of those case studies oops i think i skipped the last batch which is okay uh, maybe i go back i don't think i better go back okay so this was a cat so i actually started in creative i didn't start in statistics at all i got dragged into it because i used to give talks on spreadsheets and stuff okay I don't know if you see the difference, but I've put this slide up with the individual catalogs up at DMA shows where I talked on testing. And only about 40% of the audience after a minute could tell what the difference was flipping it back and forth. We deliberately tried to make it very, very, very similar because I was handing out my catalog like this, this kind, and it had name brand stuff on it. Because we were really proud that we worked with big name brands. So we had Ford and we had Pontiac and 3M and J.I. Case and Caterpillar and all that. And I'd hand it to a friend 
And they would say, why would I want a Pontiac hat? And I'd say, no, no, this is for your company name. This is for, you know, your employees or your customers. Oh, yeah, we buy that stuff. And then they'd start looking through it. Well, after that happened about a dozen times with people who owned companies, I realized that perhaps we weren't getting across the the message here. And so we decided to do this test. I had to fire the creative director um, because he wouldn't do it. He said, you're going to ugly up our catalogs. So he was the only guy I've ever said, you're fired. And, you know, and that was it. So the new guy came in and and one of the junior designers said, you're going to ugly up the catalog. And Peter Soik uh, spun around and he said, your job isn't to decide what we're testing. Your job is to make it as unugly as possible. So we let him do nice little logos and stuff on here. And, you know, Peter said, well, how much do you think this will will lift and i said oh i don't know 20 percent. i think people aren't getting this well we mailed six hundred thousand pieces three hundred thousand of each and there was a 40 percent difference on the your imprint here there wasn't another word of copy that was different nothing here nothing there nothing in the inside not one word of copy or pricing or anything changed just the cover image and it got us 40 percent increase uh deluxe hired me for creative and I looked at their catalog and I said, deluxe business forms, you mean high quality business forms? No, no, you know, we're deluxe check. I said, I know, why don't you use your own logo? Well, it's down there in a corner. I said, let's try something else. We did this with a little benefit, you know, I schlocked it up. You can get it FedEx, you know, all this stuff, the 800 number real big, not this little teeny one. And I don't remember what it did, but I know that it just beat the tar out of this. They never went back to this sort of format. They had a big agency in Chicago who put that together. Hopkins Medical, see, look at this, same price, same price, same price, same price, same price, and a lot of fine print. I said, you know, after talking to you guys, it seems like, you're good at compliance. There was a lot of shakeup in the, in the home health care industry and HIPAA had been passed and then the home health care nurses going, you know, going to the elderly were really concerned that they weren't necessarily following the rules. And so we then changed it to helping you meet HIPAA privacy standards, lock bags are essential, HIPAA staff training. We can help you meet the federal requirements. And again, they didn't split test it. Fairfield Bay, their response was going down and down and down year after year. And they said, we just can't get anybody from Chicago to drive down here to Arkansas anymore. And I said to them after the second day, usually, this is a consulting gig. And I said, you know, you've got 180,000 happy Fairfield Bay owners. And most of them are over 65 and most of them are doctors and lawyers and retired. And they're probably underfoot of their wives and who'd like them to get out of the house. I said, what you ought to do is you ought to recruit some of these long time timeshare. That's what Fairfield Bay was, a publicly traded timeshare company. I said, you ought to recruit some of these old guys just to visit. Instead of ta- trying to get people to go, to go down to Arkansas, just say, would you like to hear more about timeshare? in Arkansas. And uh, they said, well, we can't because, you know, if if they got a sale, uh, they'd have to have a real estate license. I said, no, you don't get what your in- industry you're in. You're in the entertainment business. I said, what you do is you give them points for every, every one of those people that convert. And at the end of the year, you have a big sales, con- or a sales conference and you, and you let the, let the winners you know, maybe it's a golf tournament with old washed up PGA Tour legends like Chichi Rodriguez or Jack Nichols or somebody, or maybe they want to fly in a fighter jet or something. You know, you just give them some fun because you're in the fun business. Well, about a year later, they basically they they sold the company to another travel company because they realized they were in the entertainment business. And apparently made a fortune, but I called them up and said, well, how did that go? And they said, you literally changed the timeshare sales industry. You know, that was just a two day event. Land's End had me come in, said, we want to do business to business. 
I didn't tell them they should. They just said, we want to. And so I opened their catalog, their business to business catalog. And I said, hey, let's pretend you're, let's pretend you're the president and I'm the buyer and you give me this catalog. Where am I going to buy those golf shirts? And, and uh, Dave Zentmeyer said, well, how about Land's End? I said, well, where does it say Land's End? I'm only going to give you a photocopy of this one page. There's no Land's End on there except in the label inside the collar of the shirt. So I'm going to buy them from my brother-in-law because everybody has a brother-in-law that sells ad specialties. He said, boy, is this different. <laughs> so I gave him 10 principles that he had to follow to, to, to grow his business to business division. And I got back there about 10 years later, Dave had left and then he'd come back to run it again. And, and I, and there were like an ocean of, of, you know, farm ladies from Dodgeville running, running embroidery machines. And uh, in 10 years, it got to 180 million in sales. Wyndham Hill records. I can't tell you the whole story, but anyway, they, they said our, our buyers are, 35 to 55 high income, high education men. But we rent those lists and it doesn't work. And I said, uh, well, you know, sometimes you just try not to laugh. But anyway, I said, well, how many of these CDs do you get rid of in a year? And they said, oh, about 4 million. I said, do you ever think of putting a little card in there that says we have a free catalog? They <laughs> said, no, we never thought of that. This is untapped gold, right? You see that? All these observations were untapped gold that was hidden. So they put they put a little card in. Within six months, they generated 600,000 catalog requests. And when they mailed them, they pulled 15%. That's 90,000 new buyers. It completely changed their, va their valuation and they sold to BMG Records for $17 million. I got 5,000. <laughs> so Cabela's, they told me that they they made 2.4 million. They didn't save. Anyway, they made 2.4 million on their first drop where we didn't mail all the hunters and we mailed the fishermen instead. They said, you were 2.4 million over projection on the profitability. And then the accounting department said, well, that isn't a fair test which is good that they even know, knew. So we did a head-to-head -head split test with our modeling method versus their RFM. And we generated 454,000. And we, we did it on the best possible drop for theirs to work. Uh, so it was a really nice test. Here's the early mailing results from the first fishing catalog. And these were test cells, right? But you can see the profitability drop really far off. That's when I told Dick, you know, if he just mailed to here, he'd make a fortune. But these were mostly just small test cells. So on the 2 million test, we had 73% uh, greater profit per piece. Nice. And this was the their different segments that they used. And so we were able to compare. And the, the most important point is this, is that is that we got much more dramatic slope which tells you when to stop mailing from Cabela's. Okay, and this is another one. I don't know if that's Cabela's or another client. It happened but most of the time. Um, and then when they came, and then because we came out with this, we, you know, we found that there was a 100% response rate in the top 5,000 customers of theirs. Um, I said, you should build a, a B2B. And so they came up with that big legendary, you remember the big book from Cabela's, The Perfect Bound? And they only mailed these, they only mailed the, the most obvious. And we said, no, you could go, you could double the circ, and you'd get, you'd actually make more money doubling the circ because this is based on profitability. And uh, they didn't listen the first time, but then they did it the second time. Adobe, and again, this is partly data and partly not. Adobe, uh, we found four, 40,000 dead names that they continued to mail because they had a frozen RFM score from their old order processing system when they converted several years earlier. So we dropped those. And then we were able to, we, we, we got in touch with Adobe and we, 
we found out that there was a filter that May and Spay were applying and we couldn't find anybody who could tell us what the filter was. But they were sending us like three to, to 10,000 names a month. And, and Image Club was mailing them for 12 months, whether they bought or not. So since I couldn't figure out who'd set this up and no one could tell me at Adobe or at Manspay, I said, well, just Adobe, just send me all the, all the requests you know, the PDF download or uh, uh, the, you know, they had downloads of, of, of Adobe Acrobat and other Adobe products and you were, you had to register. I said, send me those, send me all of them. Well, all of a sudden it went up to 100 to 300,000 names a month. And so what we did was we started modeling the designers based on their, just their street address because in every city I'd worked in an ad agency and there would be multiple ad agencies in the same building. They like flock together. And when I was at the ad agency, I had three company names, even though it was just me, you know, it was like Meyer Direct, RL Meyer Direct Marketing. And, you know, I don't know. So I had three business names, even though it was just me and it was all at the same address. So we started modeling how many catalogs we'd sent into a business address rather than individual or even company name. And we were able to take the circulation from 500,000 a month to a million a month and raise the profit per piece. I forget, 73, 74%. It was just stunning. And again, it changed the valuation. And so uh, Image Club bought themselves out of Adobe and sold themselves to Getty and they all made enough to start charitable foundations. <laughs> Pet Edge. We did an upscale, we did a, we did a, this is dog grooming supplies. We did a, uh, we did a, a model because one of the guys that had worked for another client of ours got, got us in there and they said, well, just try a model in the fall. And, and we did a, 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 a an AB split the way they model and the way we did. And we did, we did, uh, I think we did about 240,000 in profit and their side did about 160,000, whatever that is. So that's, yeah, probably 84%. And the president called me and is, he said, is this, this is really, you don't even know our business. I said, yeah, that's true. Um, but, the, but the model, the geodemographics said that it was, we called it Fifi the Poodle. It was, you know, upscale people in upscale neighborhoods north side gold coast of chicago kind of people and so that kind of made sense to me so we mailed it so then they said well why don't you try modeling the spring mailing and i said okay and when we did it came out to be downscale low income low population density low education low dwelling value everything low and i was sure our computers were broken but i called a friend out in the country who had a couple of dogs. And I said, Johnny, did you ever get your dogs groomed? And he said, groomed? No. What do you mean groomed? He said, I said, you know, doggy haircut. Oh yeah, sure. So right away I knew there was something fishy going on. And I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, it's getting warmer. The dog's full of burrs. Uh, the dog seems to like it. I said, do you care how the dog looks? He said, no. I said, where do you get it done? He said, oh, the vet or the boarding kennel or, you know, the pet store might have a special. And well, anyway, so it turned out that there was an unseen market, completely unseen of dog clippers, we call them rather than dog groomers. And so then what we had to do is we had to figure out how to make, how to keep the groomer, the high end, you know, dial up the dog, keep people s separate because we didn't want to, we didn't want to tell them that we were helping pet stores compete. But that was in, in the early 2000 recession and a company that had been declining in sales, we got them to grow 20% and then another 20% and then another 20%. Oh, my internet is unstable. Uh, my very favorite case study is Love Sack and that'll be probably about the end of it. Love Sack worked with us from 2014 to 2017. <laughs> And they've been growing, but mostly they were growing by adding stores in here. And their CFO said, 
I'd do anything rather than grow stores. And so they spent a couple of million on their website and with the theory that if we if we really dial up the website, we can sell directly off the website instead of selling on uh, in the stores. And uh, we'll get you the slides. I don't want to read this all. But anyway, they were doing all this stuff, but a consultant told them they should start a catalog. So we started working on the catalog and, and the VP of marketing asked, why are we sending catalogs to our customers who already understand our product? Because name recognition seems to be our biggest trouble. And I said, that's a great question. Maybe we should do a holdout test. We can actually answer it. He said, you can? I mean, he was from Mountain Dew. I said, absolutely, we can. I said, let's see what happened. And so, and then when we got the transaction data, we also looked at the catalog and it turned out that their percent of sales, the red bar is their products. And these are their, they, they were outsourcing lots of products and they were pricing them about 25% higher than Wayfair. And so their space allocation was most of the catalog dedicated to that and very little space allocated to the, their own products. And so I said, you know, you've really got this wrong and we fixed that. Um, this is all the extra products. This was their product, but it really doesn't tell you much. And this was their product. And all these other products you could buy on Wayfair for less. We also analyzed where their web customers were. And it turned out that about 80% of them were right by the stores. So their theory wasn't working. Their theory of we're going to invite people to the website. They were doing TV commercials, inviting people to the website. And the website wasn't delivering sales. OK, so this was the, the revised catalog really telling the story of their product. OK, and and what happened was we got their, their product more in line with their sales. Made sense. Then I started teaching them about testing. OK, and the first thing I did was we tested the holdout tests and we found a 300 percent EBITDA return on investment mail in the customers. They bought more. But then because we, you know, we don't have fancy matching software like Mike does, we actually look at what it's doing because it's the only way to be sure it's working. And, and uh, my IT guy came to me and said, I see a lot of orders coming in that don't, that aren't exact matches, but they're like the next door address. They're like another apartment number on the same floor or, or the next door you know, on Main Street, 123 Main Street and 127 Main Street or something like that. I said, I said to Patrick, could we include that? He said, we'll run it both ways. When we included it, it turned out there was a 900% ROI. So for every one order that was generated by the, by the existing customer, there were two more orders generated by pass along on the catalog. Well, I said, when you're making that kind of money, we need to do some prospecting. And so we started doing prospecting. We started modeling that. Here's another, you know, where they're really telling the story and showing the product. We really got it honed in. We started testing postcards and we did it with LS Direct, Brian DeLay. And I just did an interview with him. He says, they're still going gangbusters. And we tested several uh, store traffic building generation mailings. And what we found was that there was one offer that really pulled in the traffic out of four, that the one did more than the other three put together. And so we started changing their television spots to emphasize this one feature of their product. And we and when they'd visit the website, because they would still drive them to the website, then we were doing retargeting with mail and driving them to the stores with special offers. Well, that's what really exploded their, their sales. So what we did was we used the scientific method, observation, and then testing, and then hypothesis on what caused it to give us more observation. Okay, now we varied the offer, we varied the discount, we varied the terms, we tested with isolated landing pages, and they, they went from 75 million to a hundred million in one year. And they really learned it from mailing. I don't know if this will work. 
oops, I guess it didn't. Um, that was that was the this is the the founder of Love Sack, and this is Patrick that I mentioned. And what what the the founder says is, our guys really know how to spend money effectively because I taught them how to do testing in the mail. We verified the ideas in the mail, and then we leverage it in TV and in uh, and in the retargeting with mail and on the website. And that exploded their growth. And they all opened no new stores in that time period. And then they went public and they canceled the catalog and fired me, which I used to think was a bad thing, but you know, hey. It's know, the ultimate compliment. <laughs> it really is, you know. If they would have paid the whole bill, that would have been good. So the conclusion is always test something. Testing is learning. Testing makes you money, and each media has strengths and weaknesses for testing, and, and mail gives you the labeled data set. And here's some of the different ways that we grew these companies, and we grew them all. And these are other, other projects we had. <laughs> Bullock and Jones, when, when we'd meet at the DMA store, Eric, Bullock, Eric uh, Goodwill would buy me dinner. I said, Eric, I'm the vendor. You're not supposed to buy me dinner. He said, every time we use your system, we find 20% more mailable names. He said, you've made us so much money. And then they sold out to uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, who grew it from 21 million down to 7 million in just two years. <laughs> Destroyed and then everything. My bought it. <laughs> yeah. Another guy bought it out. Yeah, another guy. Well, Eric ran it with him for a long time. So yeah. if you know Eric. And here's the slope for, for uh, Bullock and Jones. And we'd helped them do a bunch of spinoffs and we really grew them. Here's some of the spinoffs we did with Baseball Express. Uh, here's some of the stuff we did Musician's Friend. Musician's Friend tested us 11 times against eight different modeling companies. And the last one was against the Guitar Center IT department partnered with the UCLA statistics faculty <laughs> and we beat them by 321% on profit per piece. <laughs> and the UCLA faculty said that we were cheating because it was not possible to beat them by that much. So I, uh, so, Oh, I can't think of, uh, I can't think of his name. The guy from, from uh, Cohere One called me up, Travis Seaton, and he said, did you know they are accusing you of cheating? I said, I didn't even know they were testing against us. See, but they were using the, the gain of a matchback model, and we were using the gain of real models with removal of the spurious correlations. And so, of course, we won. And we've repeated that over and over in the years since. So take your straw and then create the value valuable variables and so you get a vision into it wizards can help you because they know what to look for you can find gold in new markets new offers and testing 